welcome everybody. And we're so pleased that you could be joining us today on our session of the Voices of Canada Seniors, a roadmap to an age inclusive Canada. We are on day four of our free online conference exploring issues that matter most to older Canadians and how we can make Canada more age inclusive. Today, we do a deep dive with our expert panel on the issues of economic security. But first, I want to take a moment and thank our sponsors. It's critically important that we make sure that where we can, that all issues and aspects of the work that we do is free. And so Help Age Canada, the Canadian Frailty Network, AgeWell, the United Way, and IROC are all our wonderful sponsors for this conference and especially today's session. We know it takes a village and we thank our co-hosts, Help Age Canada, the International Federation on Aging, the Toronto Public Library, the Canadian Frailty Network, the NICE Network, the United Way, IROC, AgeWell, the Canadian Centre for Elder Law, the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse, and the International Longevity Centre of Canada. Just a couple of brief housekeeping details. So you know that no one's going to be looking at what's happening in your room or if your dog comes by or your kid needs some attention, don't worry about that. Your microphones and videos will be automatically turned off during the webinar. If you want to change some of your settings, how you see the video size of the speakers, there's a, a little bit of a tip here. You can drag the line between your video frame and your slides to the left, and you can adjust that at the beginning of the webinar. If you're on a tablet versus a computer, you may find it's a little bit different, but you can play around with a couple of your settings if you want to see it bigger. So you can drag the box more open. Just wanted to let you know we are recording today and this information will all be posted on our website and our YouTube channel. So let's get to it. How we're going to uh, talk about some of these issues today um, allows us to be very active and we are able to use the chat box to engage in our session on economic security for the Voices of Canada Seniors. So welcome again to our session, looking at economic security and how we make Canada more age inclusive. The chat box is available to you. Please feel free to let us know who you are and where you are. If you've got an organization that you're representing, put that information in as well to the chat box. We will be active and engaged in that. If you wanna share some great resources that you know of, please use that. For this session on economic security, the Q&A is a big part of what we're doing. And you get a chance to ask our expert panelists the questions that are top of your mind. You can do that by clicking in the double bubble icon on your screen where it says Q&A. And we encourage you to put your questions in there. We will have a big open discussion time uh, towards the end, a big moderated session, and we will make sure that we get your questions addressed. There is a very quick evaluation at the end of this webinar, Just a couple of seconds to fill it out. It's really important for us to be able to share what we know becomes best practice and also make sure that we can learn from, um, from this experience and others. So we please ask that you just take that two or three seconds to fill out evaluation. In our session on economic security for the Voices of Canada Seniors, we've got a bunch of hashtags. And I know that each one of you is quite active on social media. So these are some of the hashtags. We'll also put them into our chat box as well. So we're looking at CanAge Seniors, CanAge Voices. We're talking about age inclusive, economic security, money sense, finance, retirement, and pensions are the hashtags that we are using for these sessions. Do feel free to tweet these out and you'll see them already in our chat box from one of our team members. So I'm so delighted to welcome you today. And I know that this session is going to live up to all of the expectations that all of the other previous sessions have also lived up to. We're excited to delve into the questions about money and particularly in this time of economic insecurity. I'm going to go through just a few seconds where I introduce to you the Voices of Canada Seniors, a roadmap to an age-inclusive Canada. Then I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists and give you a little bit of information about who they are. I know that you will be as excited as I am to hear from them today. 
At that point, I'm going to invite each of them one by one to come to our proverbial stage. And they're going to share a few minutes about what they think top of mind we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive. You're going to hear perspectives from consumer issues and debt, issues about pensions and how to make sure that we don't have you know, problems with um, corporate default, what pensioners need to know. We're going to talk about other kind of regulatory aspects. What do you need to know as a savvy consumer? And questions about kind of what investment regulators are doing to make the world a bit more age friendly. It's going to be a great discussion today. At that point, we'll engage in our q and I'll share some extra resources with you and we'll close with a few follow-ups as well. So when COVID-19 started, really in Canada about the middle of March, CanAge looked around and figured that there was a piece of work that we could do to contribute. Canada was somewhat unique actually in the OECD for not having a full plan to deal with an aging population. And so we decided that we would actually do the work and write one. So for about five months, our team of about 20 plus people worked about round the clock to create the Voices of Canada Seniors, a roadmap to an age inclusive Canada. We talked with hundreds of people from archbishops of the Anglican church to the guy around the corner, from regulators to bankers, the financial sector, we talked to pensioners, we talked to organizations, we talked to lots and lots of seniors. We also talked to academics in the field of finance, health, wellness, sociology, social work, law. We looked at issues of ethics. We looked at issues of how community development and urban planning play a role. We rolled into that, all of the commissions and all of the inquiries we've looked at, investigations by ombudspersons, and we came out with the roadmap for Canada. It's not partisan. It's a, it really is a faithful representation of what, what we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive. The roadmap is pretty simple to navigate. It's got six compass points, which you see here, violence and abuse prevention, optimal health and wellness, infection prevention and disaster response, caregiving, long-term care, home care and housing resources, today's session on economic security, and, and a little bit later, our other session on social inclusion. It's got six compass points, 40 issues, and 135 recommendations. We're excited to say that you can both uh, download it on the website at canage.ca slash voices, or you can use it online at that same canage.ca slash voices. And you can navigate dynamically around it by going to the issue and opening it up and you'll see the recommendations right there in front of you. Extremely easy to navigate. So if you were online and you looked at E, you would open up and you would see these issues and then you would click on the issues and you would see within them, there are very specific recommendations. And who are the recommendations to? Well, they're kind of all of us. The recommendations for yes, policymakers, regulators, but they're also areas for community, philanthropy, private industry, and also for individuals. You can see that in our conversations, we are coast to coast to coast. And we are so pleased to see that even in our participants today, we've got folks all the way from Newfoundland and Labrador, all the way over to Vancouver Island and up in the North and down in the South. And that is really representative of CanAge who really wants to make sure that we capture the voices of Canada's seniors. So I'm Laura Tamblin Watts. I'm the CEO of CanAge. I've been focusing for a few decades now on issues regarding aging. My background is in law. I also want to disclose that I am a board member of IROC, one of our sponsors today, and we are having Lucy uh, speak to that. There's no conflict there. I just want to share with you that I'm recently appointed to that. I'm so excited about bringing in the voices that we're going to see today. One of our leaders in the fields of defending pension rights and making sure that we don't have another one of those Sears pension default issues is the work of Michael Powell. Mike has been tireless in advocating 
for Pensioners, and he's the president of the Canadian Federation of Pensioners. He has a long career with uh, GMO Canada. He has worked in all kinds of aspects of business and critical projects, almost always engaged with innovation and quality assurance. He is coming from a background in, um, in engineering and industry, and also his master's of science in information management from Carnegie Mellon. Thank you. Dear friend, Lori Campbell is an expert in consumer credit and also a CanAge fellow. Lori is very widely recognized as one of Canada's top experts in personal finance, credit, debit, insolvency, credit report. You will have seen her on TV. You will have seen her in education sessions. You will have seen the work she did you know, for 30 years to bring the voices of Canada's seniors, as well as across the life course from youth and teens to make sure that they are understanding what they need to do in terms of financial literacy and consumer debt issues. She's also a proud CanAge fellow. So pleased to introduce my friend, Lucy Becker. Lucy is the Vice President of Public Affairs and Member Education Services at IROC. And, and Lucy has a lot of different hats that she wears in that role. She charges up their corporate communications. She also engages with their public affairs, leading that work and also creating the delivery and opportunities for education for member education services and also investor resources. And if that sounds like a big job, it's because it's a really big job. You know, personally, Lucy comes from a passionate background in the area of supporting people who are more vulnerable, who have a social need. And she has been dedicated also in her private and volunteering work to raise up the voices of those who need it most. We're so pleased to have Lucy with us today. Another dear friend, Deborah Gillis, she's Senior Legal Counsel at the Financial and Consumer Services Commission of New Brunswick. And Deborah has been at the forefront of talking about issues that deal with financial elder abuse, vulnerable investors, and she also sits as one of the as the chair of the North American Securities Administrators uh, Group on Vulnerable Investors and Vulnerable Seniors, a proud New Brunswicker. She has really been at the forefront, not only in her province and in Canada, but actually globally on these issues. And so we're excited again to have Deborah's experience today. At this point, I have the pleasure of inviting each of our panelists one by one to our proverbial stage. And I'm going to start off with inviting um, Lori Campbell to come and set the stage about what it is that we need to know during the time, particularly of COVID-19, but not only during COVID-19, with regards to making sure that people know what they need to know. Consumer and debt issues are real. We know that in the time of economic insecurity, like we are starting to go through, people sometimes make choices they shouldn't make or believe that something is helpful when it actually isn't. So Lori, I'm gonna turn the stage over to you and I'm gonna ask you the big broad question. What do we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive with regards to economic security? Sorry, I was muted, sorry, my apologies. Uh, thanks so much, Laura, and thank you very much for inviting me to be on this, pan this panel with these esteemed uh, individuals and uh, to talk about economic security. You know, my past experience has told me over and over again that seniors are at risk of financial insecurity on so many levels. First of all, we know that fraud with seniors is probably the largest cohort for individuals across Canada. That's number one. Number two, we talk about issues with individuals, seniors staying in the workforce. And one of my experiences I've seen over and over again is that individuals that leave the workforce because they're retiring or are forced out as a senior have a very, very difficult time getting back into the workforce. Then there's the issues of, of, of helping their adult children, especially during COVID, where we've seen so many people lose their jobs or have economic insecurity. And often adult children and grandchildren rely on their families to help them out, especially their parents. And I wanna also talk about what options are available for seniors who are finding themselves in financial difficulty. So let's start by talking about fraud. 
Fraud in Canada is a multi-billion dollar industry to a certain degree. Uh, if you start looking at mortgage fraud, uh, you know, fraud with CRA, as we all know about those phone calls, uh, phishing, uh, the grandparent fraud, dating frauds. So let's kind of chunk it down a bit. And we're, I'm going to talk about things that are very important to seniors. First of all, CRA fraud. There's nothing worse than getting a call from someone who says they're from Canada Revenue Agency and says that you owe money and you must pay it immediately. Uh, they have information about you that you may feel makes them legitimate. Uh, they tell you if you don't pay up immediately, you could go to jail. And they tell you that there is no other recourse for you but to pay this debt immediately. Or you could be charged with some type of fraud or some type of, uh, you know, uh, criminal activity. So Anytime you get a call like that, hang up immediately and call Canada Revenue Agency and ask them if they've reached out to you. 99.9% .9 of the time, they haven't reached out to you. In fact, the only way they're going to reach out to you in the beginning is through mail. So make sure that you understand that this is not a legitimate means of CRA reaching out to you for information about your finances or for any money that you might have outstanding. That's number one. Number two. Fishing, you might get an email from your bank saying that you need to, you know, there's some activity on your account, you need to change your password, whatever the case may be. Again, they will not reach out to you in that format. They are not going to reach out to you through email. If you get any email or phone call or anything like this, text, that's another way they try to uh, communicate with you, contact your bank to make sure that your accounts are safe and that you were not contacted. Again, do not respond to these. Make sure that you never respond to these types of emails or communications. There's the grandparent fraud where you, uh, you know, your grandchild's away, they're in trouble, they're asking for money, they don't want your, their parents to know because they're embarrassed, whatever the case may be. Again, do not respond to this. Contact your grandchild directly to make sure that they are okay. Dating scams. These ones really, really get to me because it's, it, they really hit on vulnerable people. The dating scam situation is where individuals try to get to know you. They tell you they love you. They try to engage with you on a dating website, usually for seniors, but they can never meet you. They always need money. They've lost their wallet. They're stuck in another country. There's excuse after excuse after excuse, but they're always asking for money. So many people have lost tens of thousands of dollars to these types of scams. So the message I have to do for you today when it comes to scams, do your homework, never react to anybody asking you for any money and contact the authorities. If you're concerned about any type of fraud, you can contact the Canadian Anti-Fraud Association and ask them for information about this or ask them for help. Next, I wanna talk about uh, the situation that many, many grandparents are in or parents are in elderly people where their family members are asking for money due to the fact that they've lost their job during COVID or they may be asking to move back in. They may be asking for help for a specific uh, expense. And we all wanna help our children. We all understand that, but make sure that you understand what the expense is for if you're willing to help them. And if it's a one-time expense or if they're gonna need ongoing help. You need to determine whether you can actually afford this. When I used to work with Credit Canada, one of the main concerns that we had with a lot of seniors coming in is helping their adult children. And then they found themselves in debt and they found themselves in a situation where they were looking to go back into the workforce because they can no longer manage their finances due to helping their adult children. Adult children asking to move back in. If they need to move back in and you're willing to help them, ask for what kind of a time frame they're moving back in for. Put a limit on it, say it's six months. Ask them what, what work they're going to do to find a job or how they're going to be able to save money. It's important because this is your financial future as seniors. And, you know, a message out there to all family members is to engage your parents to make sure that, that uh, they are not victims of, of any situation where it impacts their finances. The other issue I want to talk to you about briefly is insolvencies, uh, consumer proposals and bankruptcies. If you as a senior or you anybody, as a matter of fact, find themselves in a situation where they need to look at a bankruptcy or a consumer proposal, make sure you go to a legitimate trustee in bankruptcy. Make sure you look at all your options regarding your financial situation for, before making su such an extreme decision. Do not worry about going to several trustees if you need to, to get the right information. And if you're concerned about that, you can always go to Industry Canada to get advice from them. And 
I will leave it at that. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm sure we'll have more to discuss as our uh, panel goes on throughout the hour and a half. And thanks so much for listening to me. And I look forward to hearing from the other speakers. Thanks so much. There's so much to know, particularly as we have a multi-billion dollar industry really in frauds and scams. And people are really just struggling to understand what their obligations are, what they're supposed to do. I'm sure we've all had them. I've had a spate of them recently. Just to give you a sense of how COVID-19 has played a role in that, we've got something in the neighborhood of a, you know, a tenfold spike in frauds and scams since COVID-19 that are directly related to that. So with no further ado, I wanna dig into another key issue. And that really has to do with you know, pensions. So I'm going to invite to the stage, Mike Powell. And, and Mike, you and I have talked for a long time about trying to make sure that people even understand what pensions are. Um, you know, are they something, are they a gift from the industry? What are pensions? And, and how do people need to pay attention to that issue if they have them or don't have them? And kind of what do we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive for pensions? So I'll turn the stage over to you, Mike. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Um, Canadian Federation of Pensioners, uh, we have 20 active member organizations. We advocate on behalf of over 270,000 defined benefit pensioners and their families across Canada. When I say active members, because we have past members and we have members organizations that are transitioning out because their companies have failed. One of our companies was Nortel, a very famous bankruptcy. Um, People can probably remember the stories and they're true, where for at least a period of time, there were Nortel retirees had to live in their cars. The Nortel retirees had to set up a service to match up roommates because the retirees could no longer afford to live where they had, were before. One of our members transitioning out is Sears. And again, Sears is very famous in Canada. The company that was able to somehow bleed off well over $3 billion in cash from the company, and yet leave the pension underfunded by about $270, $280 million. That forced a number of Sears retirees in their 70s and 80s to go looking for more work, something that should never happen. So these are just two tragic examples of many in Canada. It's not unusual for retirees of insolvent companies to lose 20 to 40% of their pension. So that's 20 to 40% of their income for the rest of their lives. There is no recovery under current Canadian law. Now, in all of these, what Sears did, what Nortel did, it's all legal. Uh, there, there's an issue that what is legal is not necessarily moral. Uh, the Canadian Federation of Pensioners, we operate under three tenets. The first is that pensions are in fact deferred wages. You earn your pension every hour you work. You simply don't get it back. You don't get paid it until you leave the company in retirement. It's not a gift from the company. It's not that certain people are lucky or unlucky. It is a deferred wage. And obviously then there's an obligation to pay it. The other tenant, second tenant, is that we believe that pensioners deserve 100% of what their companies committed to. This is a freely entered commitment on the part of the company. No question that they, they got all the accountants and all the actuaries to work all the math. Uh, there's no excuse for them not to have to fully compensate the retirees. The third tenant is that in fact, pension these pension problems, pension protection, governments have caused this problem. So governments need to solve it. Now those first two points are fairly universally accepted. The third point, requires a little bit of uh, explanation because a lot of people don't understand this. But in Canada, pensioners have no legal standing to influence, control, or even necessarily be informed about changes to the management of their pensions. Governments have through legislation and regulation usurped that power, taken it entirely upon themselves. So they have the entire control, the entire authority. They need to step up to the responsibility of ensuring those pensions are paid. And let me give you an example. Um, and first I need to define a term and provide a little bit of context. Pensions are a very complex issue. Um, the term I wanna define is solvency ratio. You hear about that if you follow the business press, 
Solvency ratio is simply the liabilities of the plan over the assets of the plan. So the solvency ratio is 100%. That means if the company was to fail that day, there's enough in the asset pool to cover all the obligations on the liability pool. People would get their full pension for the rest of their lives. The context is that's important is that there are 11 different jurisdictions in Canada that regulate pensions, all the provinces and the federal government. So there's a lot, and they're all different. So quite different than many other countries where there is one pension regulator, like the United States or the UK or Australia, we have 11, which com complicates trying to solve issues because trying to get 11 jurisdictions to all agree on anything is virtually impossible. So what's happened in the past five years in that uh, complex environment is that Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia have permanently reduced or eliminated solvency requirements for their pensions. Where they still have solvency requirements, it's only 85%, not 100%. Now, these three provinces represent well over 90% of defined benefit pensions in Canada, over 90%. In addition to that, the federal government, since COVID hit, has granted solvency relief to the pensions they regulate for all of 2020, and they broadly hinted they will do the same for 2021. In other words, the federally regulated pensions don't have to make solvency payments in those two years. That makes things worse. And this is all done without the consent or approval of the pensioners. In fact, the pensioners have not even been informed of these changes. So governments have unilaterally put seniors' future financial security at greater risk without ensuring their full understanding or consent. If you go to those very same government's websites, you look at uh, their definition of financial elder abuse, that's what it is. Now, if you go back to Nortel and Sears, those insolvencies occurred when the solvency targets were 100% and they still had those problems. Now, Teddy Roosevelt is credited with saying, complaining about a problem without posing a solution is called whining. The Canadian Federation of Pensioners and our allies like CanAge, we aren't whiners. We've made several proposals of ways pensions could be protected. Uh, you can find those on our website. You can find all of the government submissions that we've made on our website. We are solution agnostic. As long as we fix the problem, we don't really care how it gets fixed. But what is needed is concentrated effort on the part of governments in Canada to protect the seniors, to protect the retirees, to protect their pensions. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much, Mike. And you know, I love that quote. I think I may use it from now on about <laughs> that Teddy Roosevelt. Thanks so much. I'll let you uh, get off the stage, and I'm, I'm going to really just take a moment before I invite uh, Deborah Gillis from New Brunswick to to come on and and just remind people that pensions are your own deferred wages, which a lot of people don't realize. They're not something that an organization gives you or a nice to have. It's your own money that you've saved, and yet. What we were going to talk about a little bit more in our Q&A is how to make sure that the money that you have that you've put places is also the money that you get back. Deborah from the Financial Consumer and Services Commission of New Brunswick is just across a body of water from me. I'm on the other side of the Bay of Fundy for her. Deborah, you've been really working in the area of vulnerable investors, but you also you know, govern more than just investment sector, and you've been working a lot around financial issues and elder abuse and so on. So my big open question to you is, what do people need to know to be more age inclusive about economic security? Over to you. Well, thanks, Laura. Thank you uh, for asking me to speak here today. And, and thank you for tackling this problem. Um, in my role at FCMB, uh, the New Brunswick Provincial Financial Service Regulator for uh, many industries, so securities, uh, insurance, real estate agents, mortgage brokers, and, and many more consumer affairs pieces of legislation, I've had the opportunity to lead an initiative to look at the issue of financial exploitation and determine what we as a regulator can do about the problem. So in talking about how we make Canada more economically inclusive uh, this morning, my comments are going to be focused on financial exploitation of older adults and things we can do to really uh, stop and prevent financial exploitation from occurring. But first, I'm going to tell a story to show why financial exploitation is actually so harmful to economic inclusion. And that really goes to demonstrating the overwhelming negative impact that financial exploitation has on its victims. 
So three years ago, we became aware through the public trustee that she had been appointed by an order of the court as committee over a New Brunswick Residence Affairs, an order that she felt was necessary to protect the resident from two real estate agents that we actually regulated. And this was the, the allegation. Uh, two real estate agents befriended the older gentleman with limited mental capacity and convinced him to sell his house. They originally listed the home for well over its value. And then when it didn't sell, they said to him, let us do you a favor and we'll buy it from you. Only they didn't really purchase the property from him in the regular sense. They undervalued the house and entered into a convoluted agreement, one which had him lending the sum of $100,000 interest-free in exchange for a promissory note and a collateral mortgage in the amount of $100,000 to be registered against the property. They told him they'd give him $1,000 monthly to pay rent and for incidentals up to $100,000 to repay him for the loan. The rest of the money owed for the purchase of the house, $138,000, wouldn't actually be paid to him, but actually would be a renovation credit because they alleged the house was in such a disrepair that it wouldn't be sold unless they put some work into it. Then they brought him to their lawyer who acted for all parties. She actually never registered the collateral mortgage in his favor, but she did act as his lawyer and draft a power of attorney naming the two real estate agents as attorney and alternate attorney and drafted a will where they were named as executor and beneficiary. After paying for his accommodation and providing him with small sums for incidentals for about six to seven months, he became ill and landed in hospital. And it was only when these real estate agents presented to see him in hospital and in a fashion that made the medical staff feel so uncomfortable that the public trustee was alerted and became involved. At this point, he had lost his house, had little control over his own affairs and now had no money. Ultimately, it's my understanding that he ended up living in a nursing home setting. So financial abuse can strip a person of their autonomy, deny them dignity, and, and it makes it such that they're not economically uh, included in the regular participatory um, things that you would do on a normal, normal day. In that regard, I really believe tackling financial abuse and fraud is really one of the number one things that we can do to promote economic inclusion. And so to tackle the issue of financial exploitation of older adults in Canada, I really think we need to do four things. We need to acknowledge and talk about the problem. We need to educate and train on the issues to inform um, people what financial exploitation is, uh, what the signs are, and how they can get help. We need to propose policies and regulatory frameworks that respond to financial exploitation, and we need to collaborate with others in our efforts. So first, we need to acknowledge the problem. Much like spousal abuse and child abuse of the past, which was once not spoken of, we really need to do a better job uncovering, discussing, and showing Canadians that financial exploitation of older adults is happening, it's unacceptable, and it shouldn't be dismissed because it's a civil or private matter. In studies cited by the World Health Organization in 2017, financial abuse topped its list in terms of prevalence, affecting about 19% of seniors. And the WHO actually suggests that the non-reporting of this crime is much more severe and dramatic, and it's probably only one in 24 people that actually report financial abuse. And so why is this? Often people don't know what financial abuse looks like, or they're scared to report it, or don't know where to report it. Which brings me to my second point on education and training. Most of the time when we hear about concerns from our registrants, they're not calling to say, I have a client who's being financially abused or exploited, but rather it sounds something like this. I have concerns, my client's coming to appointments and they're coming with their nephew who appears to be really pushy and they're not allowing them to talk. Or my client who's usually well-dressed and spoken is coming to an appointment with a lot of unexplained bills and they really seem a little bit uh, disheveled or that perhaps their health is deteriorating. Likewise, when we listened to seniors in the province when we did outreach, they generally weren't telling us that their family members uh, were being financially abused or that they were being financially exploited. Some of the things that we heard, so older adults were generally way more concerned about frauds and scams by people they didn't know. However, most of the stories we actually heard from people in these sessions were perpetrated, uh, were stories of, sorry, actual abuse that was being perpetrated by a trusted family member or individual or caregiver. Sometimes we heard a general playing down of this behavior and it was clear that people were perhaps afraid of reporting because they feared losing support of family, losing independence, or losing access to grandkids. And some people felt uh, that it was really a private matter, they didn't want to get involved, or they really didn't know how to get involved or who to reach out to. Because there really isn't one clear definition in legislation, we need to be educating and training on the signs of financial exploitation, and whether that's for the general public or whether it's for people who are involved in the financial and consumer services sector. Uh, and those, those uh, signs of financial exploitation are very varied. They could be 
uh, anything from physical injuries to poor hygiene to sudden changes in banking arrangement, arrangements or uh, changes in expenditures. We need to let people know also that financial abuse is most frequently perpetrated by a trusted family member or friend. And actually one of the biggest risk factors for financial abuse is isolation, which is really increasingly concerning during a pandemic where social distancing is key. We need to ensure that family, friends, and those who provide services to older adults keep connected with older adults and don't allow social distancing to equal social isolation. And while I often preach that financial exploitation by friends and family is possibly more likely than by an unknown individual, fraudsters and scammers are still a complete and real threat. And so I would urge that we do a lot of education um, and, and training around the red, fa red flags of fraud. And so FCMB uh, has a lot of great resources in this area, and we try to raise awareness, not just with those that we regulate, but also uh, with the general public. And so I'd urge you to go over to our website. We have a resource, how to recognize financial decline in seniors and help prevent financial abuse, uh, protecting from fraud and financial abuse in COVID-19, uh, understanding a power of attorney, uh, and protecting your uh, retirement uh, publications. And, and I really think a lot of this uh, raising awareness and uh, you know, making sure that the regulated sector is aware of the signs and symptoms of financial abuse and where to go uh, is and can be dealt with uh, in an elder abuse campaign. And so Laura, that really goes to your recommendation number three. Uh, edging pe educating people, sorry, on whether where to go for help is also key. In Canada, there's no uh, specific crime of elder abuse under the Canada Criminal Code. And in comparison, most American jurisdictions have chosen to criminalize elder abuse by passing legislation which creates specific crimes uh, using the term elder abuse. This doesn't mean it's legal to harm older people in Canada, but it means that the mistreatment of older adults must be captured by general criminal law provisions within the criminal code. So maybe the failure to provide necessities of life or theft or fraud provisions. I think that sometimes this can be more difficult particularly for the layperson, because the criminal code is difficult to navigate. And in fact, we've had the experience that even those who are very well versed in the criminal law, such as police, do not always know how the provisions could interplay with senior financial exploitation. We need to educate on where to go for help. And we need to educate uh, that that could be police, adult protective services, the public trustee, a senior advocate, or a variety of community-based programs. Where one seeks help will really depend from province to province because Canada does not have one standard adult protective services regime. So what I say to people, uh, to our registrants and to the general public, if they have questions, really get to know your network in your province so that when the time comes, you can reach out and ask for help. The next thing I think we need to do is create a regulatory framework that responds to this types of abuse. So as a securities regulator, we joined efforts with other provincial securities regulators and SROs, including IROC uh, and the MFDA to do just that. We published for comment changes to rules to incorporate the idea of a trusted contact person and rules governing temporary holds when a registrant places a hold when they suspect that a vulnerable client is being financially exploited or perhaps that they're liking, sorry, lacking the mental capacity to make a financial decision. And Laura, this goes right to one of your uh, recommendations, recommendation 108, that we, we use this idea of trusted contact person. So the trusted contact requirement requires registrants uh, in a securities field to take reasonable steps to obtain the name and a contact information uh, from their client uh, of a trusted contact person. So somebody they might reach out to if they suspect that perhaps financial exploitation is taking place, or if, for example, they uh, can't get a hold of the client as well as consent and um, consent to reach out and contact that trusted contact person in those prescribed circumstances. The proposed amendments also set out steps that a registered firm must take if they place a temporary hold on transactions due to a reasonable belief that a vulnerable client is being financially exploited or that the client lacks the mental capacity to make financial decisions. We really believe that some of these proposed amendments increase investor protection and they provide certainty and clarity to firms how to act in these situations. Uh, in New Brunswick more recently, there's also been a change to uh, power of attorney legislation. And I think changes to regulatory frameworks like the one uh, here in New Brunswick um, will really go a long way to protecting against financial abuse. And in this particular uh, new piece of legislation, there are a few key provisions that I think are very protective. There are provisions that clearly align the duties of the attorney, such as the duty to act honestly and, and in good faith, 
There's provisions requiring attorneys to keep records, provisions allowing the appointment of a monitor, and, and provisions that allow financial, to, uh, financial institutions to actually refuse to follow an attorney's instructions if they believe it's not in accordance with the provisions of the act. And lastly, I think that organizations need to collaborate or tackle uh, financial exploitation together. You can't be doing this in silos. It's a complicated problem and it needs a collaborative effort. And I'll say that some of the more successful programs on tackling financial exploitation that I've seen in my years have really been collaborative. So for example, in Maine, recognizing that isolation was a large risk factor for financial exploitation and seeing a correlation between those who are being financially exploited and those who are frequent flyers to hospitals for things like missed medication or erratic blood pressure, they implemented a collaborative program that sees a paramedic team uh, team up and uh, do wellness checks on older participants who sign up for the program. And so these paramedics who are specially trained are invited to the homes on a regular basis, form bonds with the older adults and are often the first person the older adult opens up to if they're experiencing harm. And so these paramedics are armed with tools and they're able to help these older adults access services they might need, whether it be medical services, assistance of banks or seniors advocate. So there it is, uh, to sum it up, I guess, to promote uh, economic inclusion, I think that we need to tackle financial exploitation by talking about it, educating and training on it. Uh, we need to develop policies and regulatory frameworks that respond, and uh, we need to collaborate with others. And you have been working on all of those things, Deborah, and we're so grateful for the work and the leadership that you do. You know, it, we've been very blessed to have regulators in this country, you know, take seriously the issues of consumers. So thanks so much. I'll invite you to mute your video and I'll bring Lucy Becker to the stage. Lucy, you have been dedicated to issues of supporting vulnerable investors, making sure that people have a broad understanding of age inclusivity. And you know, you're know you playing that role from an investment industry regulator with who's got a really big reach to it as well, but there's a lot to do. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and ask you that big broad question. From your point of view, what do we need to do to make Canada more age inclusive for the economic security? Thanks. Thank you so much, Laura. And first off, I wanna say thank you to Laura and her team for putting on this fabulous conference and for having this very important conversation. Uh, we need to be having more of these types of conversations and sharing information that will help all Canadians uh, be prepared for their you know, retirement and to be able to protect their financial assets um, and ensure that they can have a, uh, a good financial uh, future. So first off, uh, what I'd like to do is maybe explain or talk Talk a little bit about regulation and why regulation matters and um, how IROC uh, helps to protect investors. So first off, a little bit about IROC. We are a not-for-profit pan-Canadian public interest regulator. Our mandate is really straightforward. Our mandate is to protect investors and to support healthy Canadian capital markets. We are actually accountable to every one of the 13 securities authorities across the country, uh, including our colleagues from New Brunswick um, and each of their governments. And so we actually do work for the people of, uh, of Canada via their governments and the securities authorities. We regulate over 170 investment dealers across this country and approximately 30,000 employees that work for them. They're everybody from the largest bank owned brokerages to some of the small and mid-sized firms across the country. In terms of how do we regulate, we set and enforce rules regarding business and trading conduct. And we also look at the solvencies of, uh, solvency of the firms that we regulate. Uh, so that tells you a little bit about who we are and what we do. Also as part of our strategic plan, we have made it a top priority and a commitment to deliver value to Canadians and to strengthen enforcement. And so for example, Deborah already talked a little bit about the work that we've been doing around providing a safe harbor for firms to be able to um, not necessarily uh, to, to park um, you know, decisions that are made by uh, uh, investors if they suspect vulnerability. Um, we're also doing work obviously around a trusted contact person. Uh, the ability to put into, into place the temporary hold. Um, in addition to all of that, we've also spent a lot of time over the last few years, and Laura has actually participated in some of this work, but we've also traveled the country to be able to strengthen enforcement. So in other words, when somebody actually harms an investor, that those um, wrongdoers will be held accountable. 
So for example, we've made significant inroads and progress in the ability to collect fines, uh, to be able to compel important information for investigations and disciplinary hearings. Um, and I will speak to that a little bit later on. Now today, I really wanted to focus on providing some tips um, and actions that investors, that Canadians, and particularly seniors can take to protect um, their assets and to ensure that they do have financial security. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of a trusted contact person. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, understanding regulation and the importance of checking um, your investment advisor's backgrounds, finding out if they're regulated or not. I think another important topic, particularly during the pandemic, is understanding risk and suitability. Um, and I'll talk about um, the fact that we do get a lot of complaints about people being put into the wrong types of products um, for their life stages. And then finally, I just want to touch a little bit on do-it-yourself investors. Uh, during the pandemic, we have actually found that the numbers of people doing online investing has actually increased significantly. And with doing online investing, there are also some risks uh, associated with that as well. So I'll speak to that in a moment. So first off, I want to talk a little bit about the trusted contact person. Uh, Deborah actually did a tremendous job in explaining some of the policy work that we as regulators are trying to do uh, to ensure that um, uh, registrants or advisors are working closely and firms are working closely with their clients uh, to have investors designate a trusted contact person. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different tact on this one um, and talk a little bit about some of the research that we actually did last year in 2019. Um, I, my group decided that we wanted to actually go out and to talk to Canadians, um, and we actually surveyed about a thousand Canadians to determine their understanding, their familiarity with provisions that they can take to uh, protect themselves if they become vulnerable, and the kind of support that there may be for the amendments we've been working on with our regulatory partners, including um, our friends in New Brunswick. Uh, and what we found is that our research, our research showed that an overwhelming majority of Canadian investors believe that protective measures should be put in place to ensure that investment firms and advisors take action when they suspect that their clients have become vulnerable or somebody may be attempting to exploit them. Um, overwhelmingly, um, nearly nine out of 10 Canadians supported having a trusted contact person listed on their account. Uh, nearly 90% supported having um, the ability to put a temporary hold if they suspect that there is something going on and that somebody may be financially exploited. And then 86% supported the concept of creating a safe harbor provision. What was also interesting is that there is nothing precluding um, investors from designating a, uh, a trusted contact person right now. Um, however, less than one quarter, only 22% of those investors that we surveyed had already designated a trusted contact person with their investment advisors. When they learned about this concept, 71% of those investors said they would immediately provide a name and contact person with the firm that they're working with and with their advisor. So at the end of the day, my call to action is to say, um, don't put things off. Um, if you are working with an investment or a financial advisor, have that conversation with them about designating a trusted contact person in the event that you do become vulnerable. I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and talk a little bit about some of the other resources that we have available that would be helpful to Canadians. Um, over the years, I came across an interesting statistic, uh, and I think it's important that we call out the statistic. Approximately 70% of women leave their investment advisor within the year of a death of a spouse. I was actually quite surprised at that kind of statistic. Uh, and then I thought about it myself, and I thought, what do you do if you have been working with a financial advisor for decades and then you want to start to, to begin shopping around for a investment or financial advisor and how do you understand regulation? Well, let me say that again, we're a real believer of doing um, research at IROC 
And we, we do know from the research we've conducted that Canadians don't understand how the industry is regulated. They don't know how to find this information. And then they don't know where to turn if they've been harmed. And so um, one of the things that we recommend is that if um, you are looking for an advisor, or if you are one of the 70% of women that leave their investment advisor, and if you're looking to change advisors, one of the tools that we have um, on the IROC website is something called Advisor Report. And you can actually find it on our website at www.iroc, that's I-I-R-O-C dot C-A. And if you go to our advisor report, you're going to find a lot of valuable information. So first off, if you want to find out if that individual is regulated by us, um, you, you will be able to put their name in, and then you'll be able to find out if, if, if they're regulated by IROC. What you're also going to find there is you're going to find how many years they've worked in the industry. You're going to find out um, if there are certain products that they can sell uh, or, or recommend. Um, and you'll also find out whether they do more than the mandatory continuing education that they're required to do. And then I think most importantly, you'll actually find out if there's ever been any disciplinary actions taken against that person or if there are any conditions in terms of their ability to be able to work within an investment firm. So again, um, um, my, my tip or my call to action there is to say, you know, at least think about or ask the questions when you're actually meeting with potential advisors, who are you regulated uh, by? And then go on to our advisor report to find out if, if they're actually regulated by IROC. So then that way, if something does happen, if you feel that something has gone wrong, you feel that maybe perhaps some of our rules have been breached, you will be able to know where to turn. And you'll also find on our website important information about um, how to make a complaint and also options for getting your money back if something does go wrong and if you have suffered uh, losses at the hands of a wrongdoer. Um, I'm going to switch topics now to go to my third point, which is the, the importance of understanding suitability. Um, and you'll probably find that for as a Canadian, if you are working with an investment advisor or financial advisor, um, you're going to find that your advisor has been asking you a lot of questions. They're collecting information to develop a picture of your financial state of health, and they need to fully understand your personal situation and to make recommendations that are suitable for you. Um, this is particularly important during times like a pandemic. Um, so it's also very, very important that if something happens during the pandemic, if somebody becomes um, ill, if you lose your job, if you have to take an early retirement, um, if there are unforeseen expenses that come up, these are the types of things that you need to discuss with your financial advisor when they happen. So for example, you may have a higher risk tolerance, but depending on circumstances in your life, um, you know, your, your risk tolerances may change and you need to have that kind of conversation. The other thing that we find at IROC is, um, you know, we, we investigate complaints um, and, we discipline, and we take disciplinary actions. Well, we have found time and again that suitability or that someone being put into a product that is not suitable for them is one of the top complaints that we get. In 2019, nearly one third of all of the prosecutions that we took were related to suitability. And on top of that, uh, seniors and vulnerable clients represented one quarter of the matters that we reviewed. So this is a really important topic. Uh, it's a really important topic to understand. It's also an uh, a topic to ask when you're meeting with your financial advisor. So when you're meeting with people, ask them questions about, you know, um, you know how do you determine risk tolerance? Um, you know, uh, do you have a complete picture of everything? How often do you want to meet with me? When do you want to hear from me? Um, don't be afraid to share information and don't be afraid to ask questions. So finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about do-it-yourself investing. Uh, what we have found during the pandemic is that, um, and I have, we've heard this from our complaints and inquiries um, uh, folks uh, with regards to the kind of calls that they get regarding online investing. Um, and so um, th these are the types of things that have been coming up more frequently. And I want to pull out a stat that we actually recently got from Investor Economics. Um, we have found that Canadians are going online and making investment decisions online through what we call order execution only firms or their OEO firms. 
And one of the things when you're working through making um, decisions as a do-it-yourself investor, um, suitability is not something that is part and parcel of that process. Um, and so there are important questions as an investor that you have to ask yourself if you're thinking about doing some online investing. Um, the statistic I wanted to share, though, from Investor Economics is, to, is, is that during the first half of 2020, there were a total of 1.21 million gross new online or OEO accounts opened in Canada. In comparison, in 2019, there were only 846,000 um, gross new accounts opened for the entire year. That's quite astounding. So perhaps um, Canadians are leery about going into um, financial um, offices. Um, you know, they're, they're becoming more isolated. They're thinking about doing things online themselves. Um, you know, a number of things are probably contributing to this. Um, another um, statistic that I wanted to share with you is that apparently uh, that our complaints and inquiries group has found that approximately 34% of the calls that they're getting um, about complaints um, relating to, to online investing are actually coming from people that are 65 years of age and older. So there is a significant portion of seniors of older Canadians that are using online um, OEO investing. Um, accounts. So uh, just today, we were going to be publishing a bulletin, um, you know, about do it yourself investing. And what we're doing is we're posing a number of questions that you should ask yourself, um, whether this is right for you or not. One of the things I know anecdotally that our complaints and inquiries folks shared with me was the fact that um, some of the comments being made was that investors actually are trying to stay away from paying fees. So they're going on and doing their own online, online investing. So as you're thinking about whether online investing is right for you, um, here are a few questions that you should ask. What is your level of knowledge about investing? Do you have the capacity to lose money on occasion? Are you actually looking for advice or not? Again, don't be afraid to, to, to have some of these kinds of conversations with your investment advisor. Uh, don't be afraid to check out some of the resources that we have online. Uh, we have a number of investor bulletins that deal with everything from borrowing to invest, risk tolerances, understanding the different types of risks. Um, so I will end it at this point, and I will also just say, please do visit our website, and also feel free to contact our complaints and inquiries group, and their number is also on our website. So I'll turn it back over to Laura. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thanks so much, Lucy. We really appreciate all the work that you're doing. And those investor education insights are really interesting because you know, we think we know a lot, and then sometimes we're having a little bit of a deeper time and we realize actually some of those questions that you're posing may not be as comfortable for all of us. So we are having lots of questions rolling in and we're excited to see that there are fantastic questions in our Q&A. Do feel free to add more to them. At this point, I'm going to invite our whole expert panel together to join us on our proverbial stage. Thanks very much. And we're also going to invite our policy officer, Brett Book, to join us as well on stage. Hi, Brett, how are you? Hi, everyone. I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Laura. Thanks so much for moderating our great questions in the Q&A. We've got 13 questions. There's lots of things to go to. So I think I'm just going to jump right in. Brett, who's our first question from and what is it today? Well, Laura, our first question comes from Lawrence. Lawrence wants to know, how can we improve financial literacy and security for underrepresented communities, such as seniors who don't speak English as their first language. Laura, I may just over to you. Laura, you've worked for a long time with a lot of ethnoculturally diverse community. You've worked in financial literacy broadly and in Toronto, which is one of the most ethnoculturally diverse country, uh, sorry, cities in the world. What are some of the things that you've learned work well? Well, certainly one of the things that we found has worked very well in the past is, is uh, we did a, a project with uh, uh, it was uh, citizenship and immigration back in 2016 on newcomers to Canada. And a lot of newcomers to Canada are actually aged people because they're coming over with their families and uh, know very little English and are at risk of as a vulnerable population on a number of fronts. So, you know, the more that we can do with government I, is, is imperative. We need to be able to get into the communities that are not uh, first, their first language is not English and be able to have experts 
work with, uh, with financial literacy experts that can deliver the message. And so that's the, that's the way that we found it was most compelling and most far reaching is you have to work with the communities. You have to find out where communities gather and you have to be able to support them in their own language and with, with, uh, with people that they're comfortable and trust uh, speaking to and, 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 and trust in general. The problem is a lot of people coming to Canada um, that don't speak English are very, they, they don't trust government and, they, and for good reasons and they don't trust the banking system and they may not even trust, um, you know, uh, the police system. So you've got to overcome those barriers and you've got to do it in a way that is a soft landing for them. That is extremely important to understand their ethnocultural background and what it is and what they need to be able to trust you and to trust the message that they're sent, you're sending them Therefore, working in the community has been a very big success in the past, and I'm sure others on the panel can speak to this as well. Yeah, thank you, Laurie. You're you've done a lot of work working in this area, and I know um, I know that Lucy and Deborah has, but I'm going to pop over to Deborah because I I know that you've been doing some particular work in this area, and you regulate as your organization not just kind of one but a wide variety of sectors. What are some of the experiences that you have that have worked well? Absolutely, thanks, Laura. So. Um... We, we do regulate a wide area and we do a lot of outreach um, in a bilingual province. So I sit in New Brunswick and we are a bilingual province. So everything um, that we produce here at FCMB is, is in both languages, uh, both official languages in English and French. And so we found that when we were doing outreach with seniors a number of years back, uh, in order to get traction, we did exactly as Lori suggested. We actually reached out to the communities and we really uh, decided that we needed an in in the communities and paired up with actual seniors groups uh, in those areas and then asked them what they would prefer. You know, how would you like us to engage? Would you like us to come for lunch? Would you like us to bring some snacks? Would you like us to do it uh, in the day when's better for you? Uh, what time of the year works better for you as well? Because if you think some of these areas have festivals going on or perhaps it's not a great time to, for older people to get out in Northern New Brunswick in the middle of January, there's a lot of snow. So I think pairing up with community groups for us was key. Also making sure that um, you advertise or you get the word out locally. And so it does us no good to try and get the message out in a provincial newspaper that really doesn't have much reach up north. So what we've really tried to do, uh, if there's particular um, scams or frauds that we want to alert people to, or if we'd like people to come to a seminar that we're hosting, we really try to reach those people through local uh, medias. And so local newspapers or local radio stations. Yeah, and, and also in, in the language, if you have sort of the Omni TV and, and so on, or analogous multicultural radio and TV, great ways of doing it. I, I could ask everyone this, but I know we've got so many great questions, so I'm just going to jump to the next one. Brett, what do we got next? Thanks, Laura. So Sarah has asked, if anyone responsible for corporate bankruptcy leading to a loss of pensions has faced legal responsibility in Canada? Mike, over to you. Well, thank you for that question. Um, it uh, that goes to our third tenant. Is it's a government caused problem? The government needs to solve it. The answer is no. Um, I mean, people associated with companies might have violated some other security and exchange laws and then got penalized for that, but not for pensions. Because if, even if you look at Sears, um, they did. I mean, they skirted the law in some cases, but really they did not break any law. They followed all the rules. So the problem is with the rules, companies will follow them, but they need to be um, changed so they actually protect pensioners. Yeah, that's great. I, I think um, I think you know pensions are one of those areas that we all think are great, and then we actually don't know anything more about them, but think that they're great. Like it very is a, such a limited understanding about it. And and certainly the loss for people when you do lose a pension because of perhaps some type of corporate bankruptcy is, um, yeah, is so profound, particularly with older people who really that's their own money and yet they don't have any recourse. So it is such an important piece, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, a lot of people also kind of think that uh, um, pensioners are extremely well off. And we can use Sears as an example. And, and this is a great example because it shows where a lot of pensioners actually are financially, as well as 
the lack of consistency across Canada. So if you were a Sears employee and you worked in Ontario, something like, and, and I can't, it's over 90%, I think it's 94 or 96% of Sears retirees in Ontario are receiving 100% of their pension because Ontario is the only jurisdiction in Canada that has any form of pension insurance. Now it's relatively woefully inadequate. It only uh, guarantees you up to $1,500 a month, which is not a great amount of money. But for the Sears employees that tended to be part-time, tended to be very low paid, over 90% of their pensioners, their pension was under $1,500 a month. Right. Now, if you were a Sears pensioner that worked in any other province in Canada, you lost 20 to 30% of your pension. Um, that, you know, that's what one of the things we look for in solutions is a solution that would actually address all Canadians equally. And again, I, I don't, uh, I can take time now, but you can go to our website. We, we've looked at a number of different solutions that, that could work. They, they all have issues. Generally, they're jurisdictional issues. You can't get the jurisdictions to agree. Um, but we've talked about pension insurance, something like the US and UK and other, com other jurisdictions have. Um, we've talked about extending super priority to the pension deficit. Right now, the pension deficit is unsecured credit. And so it gets settled last when there's generally no money left in an insolvency. Super priority is a category of obligation that would then move it near the top where there's more likely money uh, left over when you go through that process. The government could step in and offer a refundable tax credit for the loss. Um, that puts it on the shoulders of the taxpayer, which we don't like. We think the company should be required to pay it, but that's, that would be a solution. And the other thing we've looked at is a distressed pension facility a way to take these pensions that uh, get abandoned because the company has become insolvent and allow them to continue operating as an ongoing pension so that you can still pay the pensioners 100% of their pension and then deal with those pensions, manage the risk and try to go grow the assets. That's a solution that's been done sort of here in Ontario with Stelco. That's uh, what when, they, when Stelco was bought out, went bankrupt the last time, uh, they've been bankrupt several times, um, they actually set the four pensions aside and it's it's working. The pensions are improving their solvency. The pensioners have been receiving 100% of their pensions. And as the pension re, uh, gets to 100% solvency, they annuitize the pension and they, can, they continue on. So, you know, there, there are ways to address it. It's just the jurisdictions end up, don't want to, you know, get in other people's cornflakes. I use Absolutely. a different term, but I better not. And you'll see a lot of those recommendations in our Voices of Canada Seniors as well. We uh, we absolutely endorse so many of these. So much to get to. I'm looking at our time. Brett, what's our next question? Thanks, Laura. So we have a question from Zante who asks, when should someone start planning for their retirement? Oh, okay. Well, if I answer that question, you know, I would say now, whatever age you are right now. Lucy, what would you say? <laughs> I was going to say it's it's never too early to start thinking about your financial security. Uh, and, I, and I say that because, you know, when we do talk about pensions, we have seen in this country that there are few defined benefit plan uh, pensions around, even, to, um, uh, sorry, I was going to say DC plans, defined contribution plans. And, and so I think that there is a lot of emphasis on all of us um, to, to start planning and to start thinking very, very early on. Um, and as you are doing that, I'm going to take this opportunity once again, just to say that, um, you know, as you start thinking about how you're going to plan for your retirement, how you're going to plan for your financial goals throughout your different life stages, um, start thinking also about who you're going to work with, because these are significant life altering decisions that you are making. And so, um, you know, I, I can tell you that um, being a big believer in research, um, quantitative and qualitative, I have been shocked at how many times, uh, whether it's somebody that's 20 years old or 30 years old or 50 years old or 60 years old, um, but when we actually have conducted focus groups and asked investors, um, do they understand regulation? What kind of due diligence did you do before uh, choosing somebody to work with you? 
um, what kind of due diligence did you do? Um, inevitably, many Canadians don't do that. Um, you know, they get referrals from friends and family, and that may be fine. Uh, but having said that, I think it's also important to know that when you are uh, embarking on a relationship where you're going to be entrusting somebody to work with you and help you make these kinds of decisions, uh, that you need to know whether they are regulated and um, uh, where to turn if something goes wrong. Because we all like to think that you're not going to run into problems and like any profession um, you know there there I would say that I we believe that the vast majority of um, advisors are uh, interested in helping their clients succeed but sometimes you know there there are things that go wrong or people that will take advantage of people and so if that happens it's really important to understand where to turn and what some of those options are. So again, I'm gonna suggest, um, do your due diligence, ask questions. Um, don't be afraid of doing that. It's your money, it's your future, it's your family, it's your financial objectives. Um, and you have a right to be able to answer any question that you wanna ask. That's perfect. That's great. I think everyone here would agree with that as well. It's, it's never too soon. My kids turned 18. I put $100 in an RSP for them and said, you got to get ready. Okay, Brett, what's our next question? Thanks, Laura. I'm wondering if we could follow up with you, Lucy. I have a question here from John. Uh, and John wants to know, what is an example of an unsuitable investment? Yeah, and Deborah, uh, I just to let you know, I'm going to come oh. to you afterwards on that one as well. I'm giving both of you the heads up. So, Lucy, over to you first. Sure. I'll keep it very, very short. Um, suitability is very much based on, um, again, I, I'm going to say uh, having a holistic view in terms of who you are, where you are, and what your risk tolerances are. And one of the most common things that we have found is that, you know, um, having, you know, at least an annual conversation, more frequent conversations, um, you know, uh, I, I think about when I started as an investor, I started working with somebody when I was in my 20s. And when I was in my 20s, I knew that my horizon um, in terms of retirement, in terms of savings, things like that, that I was probably a higher risk investor at that time. But as I started to get older and older and, um, you know, suddenly next thing you know, you're starting to think about family or thinking about obligations, then you're moving into, you know, I'm kind of in what I would call the pre-retirement stage. So my risk tolerances have gone from, you know, being, you know, uh, able to, to, to have a higher risk tolerance, to be able to withstand losses, because I think a lot of the time people only think about how much they're going to gain, but there's also how much you can afford to lose. So that's a really, really important question. And I found as I was getting older, suddenly what's suitable for me is a low risk product, because when you have times like the pandemic and volatility in the markets um, that, you know, when you're younger or maybe at, at a different life stage, it doesn't always relate to age, um, but, you know, you could withstand losses and you can recoup some of those losses um, over the next, you know, two to three years or five years or 10 years. On the other hand, if you're 65 years old or 70 years old, then chances are you probably don't have a high risk threshold. And so these are the conversations that you should be having with whoever you're working with um, to say, you know what, I may have had a higher risk tolerance before. I no longer have that ability to do that. And so, you know, your financial advisor needs to be able to really understand where you are, what your objectives are, and what your risk tolerances are and to put you in products that are suitable for your life stage and your circumstances. Thanks so much. Deborah. I'm going to you. This is a piece that I'm sure that you, you hear about a lot and you've got to think about a lot. Can I ask you to build on that a little bit? Uh, absolutely, but I, I'll say, Lucy, you did an excellent job. So I don't know that there's a whole lot I can really add there, but to really just say that, you know, suitability really depends on uh, an individual and what's suitable for one person is certainly not going to be suitable for another person. And what's suitable for somebody at an early stage in life is certainly not going to be suitable for somebody later in life. And so what might have been suitable um, for somebody, you know, when they're starting their family in their 20s and their 30s is not going to be something that's going to be suitable for the same person when they're 60, 65 and on the verge of retirement. And I think that's really important um, for people in this field to be checking back with their clients quite regularly, to be assessing uh, and to be knowing their client, to be knowing 
um, exactly, you know, what, what sort of stage of life they're in, what sort of worries they have at that point in time. You know, do they have three kids going off to of school? Do they have health concerns, this sort of thing. And so, you know, I think sometimes um, something that might've been perfectly acceptable to somebody who was starting a family, uh, a very high risk uh, type investment perhaps for somebody in their thirties. Now, when they're 65 years old, it might not be. And in fact, you know, it, it might be a sign that perhaps the person that accompany it, that is accompanying them to appointment that is pushing um, for them to make this investment might be a sign of financial exploitation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, that, that piece about suitability and unsuitability is really important. And uh, it's not just about your personal opinion, but it's also about the context you're in. And I have to ask a little bit, if you're pushing for, you know, bridges over swamps in Florida right now, I think that that may need to be a bit of a red flag First of all, no one's going to Florida right now. That's the other part. So, uh, okay, Brett, we got. I'm trying to squeeze in a couple more questions. What do we got? Thanks, Laura. So we have Mark um, who says, "What action have the organizations represented here uh, in this session done to advocate for bringing education on financial exploitation issues and power of attorney responsibility issues to the younger adults in the high school system, maybe even as a mandatory course?" Yeah, I'm heading over to Lori for this one who's nodding already because Lori, you've been involved in a lot of financial literacy issues really across that life course. Can you share a little bit about financial literacy and exploitation and some of the ideas that you've been working on for younger people? Well, certainly, thanks, Laura. I mean, certainly when I was on the task force for financial literacy and the follow-up steering committee on financial literacy, that question came up over and over again about how important it is to have mandatory financial literacy education in the school system. Some uh, provinces have done a fantastic job. Out west, we know that British Columbia has a very, very detailed system of financial literacy uh, for young adults. In Ontario, it's a bit of hit and miss, although Ontario has worked very hard to try to implement financial literacy, but we need to do so much more. I mean, I think there, there's this is a great question. I think there's so much more that needs to be done across the country because we're talking about now power of attorney. Young adults don't understand this. They don't understand RSPs. They don't understand what a mortgage is and how uh, compound interest works. They don't understand credit and, and debt and, and the implications of getting and using too much credit card debt, which will cut credit cards in a bad way, let's say not paying them off, which the interest is astronomical on. Payday loans, don't even get me started on payday loans, where <laughs> that's one of my bigger beefs. So, you know, while the, while the school system has a hit and miss sort of uh, approach to it, and Ontario's done more, and so is British Columbia and, and some provinces, we need so much more done. And that's one thing, I think, a shout out to uh, government and to the provinces, because it is a provincial uh, issue. We need to get our act together. We've seen the fallout of, of serious debt problems on older adults, on adults raising children. We see, we're going to be seeing a soaring bankruptcy uh, situation in the next three to six months. And you, I, I think you could bet on that one. So this is the result of so many factors, but certainly yeah. financial literacy. And I just want to, again, you know, thank you for your leadership. I mean, Lori has been at the heart of you know, financial literacy across the life course for decades. And you know, the materials and the work that we do have is a large part, you know, thanks to you. I know as well that Deborah, you've also been looking and in fact, didn't you just release something about children and youth and financial literacy in New Brunswick? Maybe share a little bit about some of the innovative work that you're doing in there as well. Absolutely, thank you. <clears throat> so um, what we're doing at SCMB and what we've been doing actually for many years, we've partnered um, with the school systems here. So both the Anglophone and the Francophone school system. And we offer presentations actually in the school to students um, about things like financial literacy, about we've talked about financial exploitation in the context of recognizing the signs in your grandparents perhaps being financially exploited. And we talk about general money management, and budget, budgeting and these types of things. We also have a great publication on our website called Make It Count which uh, is for parents to use. And there's also a, a teacher um, pamphlet as well that you can use to have the conversation with students. And as you can imagine, we're not going into schools very often these days. And so uh, what are our colleagues down in the education and communications department have done 
They've done a lot of uh, presentations already via Zoom, but they're also launching a, um, a series online that is going to be um, something that teachers can use like a lesson planning series. And that should be launching within, I believe, a, a month or so. So check back online. We'll have a lesson planning series for teachers to utilize in the class because we can't be there to uh, help out this year. And I just want to say that some of those resources that you're referring to are in the chat right now or links that will be active to them as well. You know, I love doing a good poll. I really do. It's the academic in me that wants to do it. So I think that we actually have a poll for our panelists and our participants. So panelists, you get to participate, I think, as well, if you want. So Christiane, why don't we launch our poll? We've got a couple questions here. The first question is, do you file taxes by yourself? or with the assistance of an accountant or other professional? You have a choice of myself, family or friend, accountant or other professional. Um, I hope the answer is at least one of those because it means otherwise you haven't done your taxes. Two, do you have an RRSP or savings plan? I would include a pension in that question. So savings plan, we're calling a pension as well. Do you have an RSP or a pension savings plan for your retirement? Three, do you think seniors need more information about frauds and scams? And four, do you think Canadians have a good understanding of how their investments work? Again, I'll just quickly read those for you. File your taxes, who does it for you? Myself, family member, friend, accountant, other professional. Do you have RSP or a savings plan? And I'm including pensions in that conversation there. Third, do you think seniors need more information about frauds and scams? And the fourth is, do you think Canadians have a good understanding of how their investment works? All right, I'm just gonna close the poll and I'll show you what we've got here. So it's a real mix with the first one. Do you file your taxes by yourself? About 35% said myself, about 8% uh, a family or friend, 54% an accountant, and you know 4% for another professional. So a bit of a mixed bag there, kind of what you'd expect, I think. Do you have an RRSP or savings plan, including a pension or except? This is a pretty savvy group. Okay, 92% said, yeah, they've got a plan. And the third is, these are pretty good and strong results. Do you think seniors need more information about frauds and scams? 100% of respondents said yes. Do you think the Canadians have a good understanding of how their investment work? 100% said no. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty clear, pretty clear set there. All right, 100% yes for frauds and scams and 100% no on investments. I'm going to uh, thank our panelists and invite them for just this minute. They can step off stage and I'm going to wrap up with a few uh, key resources and messages that we have here. And then I'll invite them back at the very end to say goodbye with just a little quick wave. So today we were exploring the question, how can we make Canada more age inclusive? The Q&A was fantastic. Brett, thank you so much for your great moderation and our tons of questions. If we didn't get to your questions, don't worry. We will answer all of them and share that information with you afterwards as well. So you're getting some follow-up. The chat had great information. Again, those resources will come to you as an after as well. But here are all the websites of our participants today. Again, this webinar, this conference is available offline after this session as a recorded webinar at canage.ca slash webinars and also on our YouTube channel. Our friends at Help Age Canada are um, raising some philanthropy and support. If you are moved and want to support some of the ish initiatives uh, that we've discussed, you can click on the donate button at Help Age Canada and, uh, and share some of your economic security with somebody else's need for economic security. I'm hoping you'll take this time to pop onto our website at canage.ca and join to be a member. We can't write to you unless you tell us that we can and you'll get great resources, including newsletters, updates, and most importantly, you'll be part of the advocacy to make positive change to make Canada more age inclusive. So please take us just a second and reach out to us at canage.ca and get a free one year membership. Again, it doesn't cost a thing, so it's really good on your economic security, but that lets us get in contact with you and lets us, you know, use your voice to advocate for positive change. After this, we just got a very quick break, just a bit more than a half an hour, and we come back at one o'clock Eastern Standard with our last session in our free online conference talking about social inclusion. Don't miss this session. We've got folks talking about the role of libraries, 
digital literacy, where you have the person who is heading up the programs for the United Way for Healthy Aging, talking about what they've done around social inclusion, including loneliness and men's sheds and making sure that people are able to get the resources they need during COVID-19. We're gonna hear from Connected Canadians about digital literacy and their fantastic program for tablet lending and one-on-one -on -one training for seniors to become more digitally literate. We're going to hear as well from Dr. Raza Mirza about the Home Share program, different innovative housing programs, as well as an online free resource that's also available as a telephone resource where you get to talk to social workers about some of the challenges you're finding. It's called Talk to Nice. It's going to be a terrific session. So we hope that you grab a quick bite and come on back and join us. At any time, please feel free to reach out to us at canage.ca. I'm available very easily at laura, L-A-U-R-A, at canage.ca. You'll make sure that we'll get back to you right away with any questions you may have. Or if you're interested in collaborating, that's one of our key aspects. So we're really hoping that you can reach out to us at any time. Again, sign up for our newsletter, join. Here's our social media. We are very active on social media and we hope that you will take an opportunity to share and retweet some of the messages and we'll make sure that we do that for you as well. So we are at Twitter at CanAge Seniors, same for Instagram and Facebook, and you'll find us on LinkedIn and YouTube at, at CanAge. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to invite our panelists to unmute their video, join us back on the stage for a quick goodbye, a quick wave and a little thank you so much for thank all of the work that you have done to our expert panel, the work that you shared today, but also each of you in your lifelong work to support the economic security across the life course and your work to make Canada more age inclusive. So I just want to invite you to say quick bye and a little thank you to everybody. Thanks so much, Laura. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you to you everyone. everyone. Take care. Take care. Have a great rest of your day. And for those of us joining, please take a quick break and we'll see you in just over a little bit of a half an hour at one o'clock Eastern for our next and last session in our conference on social inclusion. Thanks everyone and have a terrific time. Thanks again.